Are you are you looking at the script here, Mitchell, where it just says, Mmm, Zach Johnson? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add an I so that I don't do that. I'm Zach Johnson. I'm Mitchell Hora. Before, before we get too far, thanks a ton to the Walton Family Foundation for supporting us throughout this entire season. We've got a little mini series going on here at the podcast now where we look at what it takes to build a conservation culture. And we just happen to know of a great case study in Washington County, Iowa, which is where Mitchell is from. Yeah, this is an area where a bunch of farmers have embraced no-till. They started doing that decades ago. Now cover crops is the big one, and things have really just continued to grow from there. Yeah, one of the big things you notice as soon as you get there is that, you know, everybody's trying something. That's that's kind of the feeling that I got is that there's a lot of cover crop. No-till is huge there, but everybody's always experimenting. Yeah, there's a lot of livestock in this area too. Um, so there's starting to be a little bit more diversity around that, but there's plenty of different like market options and stuff. And yeah, people that have been using no-till for 40, 50 years, some of them, and I suppose they're just getting bored with only that. Now there's trying to make things more challenging for themselves. And, you know, there's some guys in the area that have tried bioreactors, trying different cropping systems, integrating livestock, lots of different things happening. Yeah, we wanted to figure out how this spirit of conservation actually got started. You know, who were the key players? Last episode, you heard about the amazing Iowa State Extension Director, uh, Jim Freer. Everyone we talked to mentioned him as really kind of a big key to what was going on down there. And Jim helped to facilitate a lot of the networking and knowledge sharing around these conservation practices. He had a ton of enthusiasm for conservation and was just a great resource for a lot of people, by the way, it sounds. Yeah, as we did interviews with folks in Washington County, pretty much everyone also talked about the importance of some other folks. Uh, guys who are key to getting the equipment side of things nailed down for no-till so that farmers could adjust their equipment. Paul Reed is a farmer from Big Family that did a ton to figure out the best planter attachments. He farms with his brothers, but works a lot with his first cousin, Dave Muller. And Dave's an equipment dealer who is also instrumental here in Washington County. We sat down with Paul and Dave together, and we talked with them to learn more about how crucial adjusting your planter really was. And what was really cool is that they were doing a lot of research and piecemealing, designing, researching how planters were really going to work for a no-till situation in Washington County. Yeah, Paul's family started no-tilling corn back in 1982 and actually won the Iowa Masters No-Till Division that year, which inspired them to go full-on no-till but first they had to figure out how exactly they were going to make it work in the heavy clay soils during planting. Back in the early 80s, our farm made a decision to go to all uh, no-till, make a move, and we struggled. Our soils were mellow and moist, high clay, but we were getting inconsistent results. And so my late brother Nick and I did a lot of test plantings in mud holes in March is where we, where we worked. And uh, we would go out there and plant with your standard John Deere Maxim Merch row unit. And it would be moist, but it would do a nice job. But within three days, it turned to pottery. And we, we be- came to understand that we needed to figure out what was going on. And until we did, we thought long-term no-till was doomed. So I have to give you a little background because to understand where we're at today and why how important Dave's uh, Dave is and the equipment side is, you have to understand what the issues were and how we got to. So uh, let me back up. So in 1969, we we all had runner type planters, dried out cloudy seed beds, and John Deere commissioned uh, four University of Illinois college students to flag seeds and uh, report and and document how they grow and why. What they found is seeds that had seed to soil contact grew and germed immediately. And the other seeds laid there in the loose soils and waited for a rain and they didn't actually germinate till it rained. And that could be from two hours to two weeks. 
And so they got uneven growth, uneven emergence, and uneven ear size. So John Deere set about to fix that, and they came out with the John Deere Max Emerge row unit in 1972. What a breakthrough. So that row unit could go out, and it forms a true V by using it. This is key. uses a combination of wedging and pressing action at the same instant to form that true V. What a breakthrough. And that dried out cloudy seed beds that we all had back then, that's exactly what we needed. So we got enhanced uh, seed to soil contact on those seeds that grew evenly and, and emerged evenly. So how is that V different than what there was before? It was more of just a, more of a single disc opener so versus the, like V in and the out? The runner type uh, opener basically made a, a, a parted the soil like in a wave, mm. and then drop the seed in, but the closing process was very, there wasn't one, basically it just had a depth tire behind it. Look at your old John Deere 456s in International. I can't even remember the numbers on those, but anyway, there wasn't any seed to soil, con there wasn't a true V. Basically, we're just throwing them in the soil and mashing running the, over them. Mashing the trench. Show. Zach, Ma I thought that's how planting worked. You just toss the seed out yeah. there and you're just good to go. Yeah, <laughs> didn't come somebody say that October. once? <laughs> you just toss the seed and maybe we just glance over that. So, yeah, we can glance over so that if you So <laughs> if you understand that the Maximerge row unit was born in a dried out cloudy seed bed, when you take that same row unit and you put it in a high clay, cold, wet soil, and you use a combination of wedging and pressing actions to form a true V, that equals uh, inconsistent, more inconsistent growth. So here was the American farmer we came to realize was held hostage to a, let's see, when was 1972, 25 and 20, 45 year old row unit design. So we were fitting our fields so our row unit would work. You know, why don't you no-till? Because I get inconsistent results. I get sidewall compaction. I get all these negative things. It grows slower. And it was all because of the, the Maximerge row unit, which all planters are based on. And so we set about to change how that row unit worked so that we could fit the row unit to the field instead of fitting the field to the row unit, which is what most farmers are doing unknowingly. And so that's where everything was born. It was in a mud hole in March, and everything else is gravy. So we, our farming operation ranges across about 93 miles. And so we plant in every type of soil. We pride ourselves on being able to no-till plant two to three days before any of the tillers can get out there. Uh, we love goo balls. We like to plant with... Uh, our planter's sinking in four to six inches when we turn. If those transport tires aren't sinking in, we're a little slow. So y you can understand where this system, where it came from. Like so heavy, I high clay, cold, wet soil. So you don't have that in Minnesota, right? Not a lot. No. Oh, uh -uh. Okay. No, not at all. <laughs> and this is really interesting, though, because I've, I've actually, I don't think I've ever heard anybody bring this up the way you're doing it. So, so where do you go from there? How do you make it better? How do you make how do you make the planter fit the field then? So that's when, um, so my brother and I are working in these mud holes in March, but we we're not very smart, but we follow smart people. So we talk to people like Jim Kinsella, Howard Martin, Eugene Keaton, and some of these other inventors out here, and all of us are made fall into one category. There's about 3% of us are inventors, about 15% of us are innovators, about 65% of us are followers, and about 3% of us are laggards. So we like to think that we fall in the innovators. They're the guys that generally make the money. The inventors, they're on to something different, and, and it's tough for them. So we, start, we capitalized on a lot of the, the ideas and innovations that they came up. Jim Kinsella came up with the uh, of using the RID tire to let the seed opening discs explode and fracture their own uh, sidewall compaction. Uh, Eugene Keaton came up with the Keaton seed firmer to press and hold the seeds into the bottom of the V and enhance the seed to soil contact. Howard Martin came up with the original tooth row cleaners, which he sold to John Deere. Mm -hmm. um, and then he came up with basically the tooth uh, closing wheels also that leaves the soil loose and aerated behind the row unit. But we put them together, we came up, and then the down pressure, we came to understand that the 
the compression and compaction that the row unit was causing, also the weight of the row unit. So when you add the, back then they had heavy duty down pressure springs, four to 500 pounds they put. So let's, we weighed a row unit with the bathroom scales. It weighs about 265 pounds. You add uh, 75 pounds of seed, a little mm -hmm. insecticide, and a little down pressure from the spring. Say so you could get the 800 pounds. The weight of a small, or of a steer, concentrated on two to four square inches mm. on each side of the seed furrow and you combine that with high clay cold wet soils you got a recipe for disaster so so back us up though so you're pulling together all these different components and stuff but you guys were just farming and but Correct. you were out there looking at these guys you must have been searching on them on youtube or something we like went that. to we went and talked to them we would be on the phone um, we didn't have internet back. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, um, it wasn't you. Yeah, it was in the 70s. No <laughs> internet. That went Come on, Mitchell. That completely was, over my head and then I heard you back. laugh and I'm like, "Wait, what did he what did he <laughs> Yeah, you were not on YouTube <laughs> you searching for yep. Wait, you don't have your backup 8 minute button so you could go back and hear <laughs> No, it's just... very hard for a guy like <laughs> oh, it's me. It's kind of hard for. <laughs> yeah. So we tried lots of ideas and putting things together and uh, i remember when the tooth rope cleaners howard sent us one of the first sets of those dons we also started working with those but then the tooth closing wheels howard go i said howard is throwing the seeds out it's it's doing kind of what we want and he goes i know it'll work i just know it'll work he said widen them out so we widen them out to a two and five eighths to three inch spacing mm -hmm. and then he said reduce the down pressure put the handle ahead and then with the case ih reduced inner diameter tire that exploding the sidewalls of those tooth closing wheels just sunk in on their own weight. And we could dig our seeds with a McDonald's straw behind the row unit in high clay, wet, mucky soils. We've even pushed it to the extreme, Kevin and I, to plant in free water. That's where water runs into your seed trench. You go, how in the hell? And it, it was 223 bushel or check how can you plant in free water so so we're throwing out a whole lot of stuff here and, and obviously I'm we're excited. catching a lot of this zach and i are catching a lot of this but we got to slow you down a little bit paul yep. so you guys were out there experimenting with all this stuff in the 80s here even though there had been some work going on in the 70s and some of these names that you're throwing out they have companies and parts named after these people today martin till and keaton and all these guys so back us up even before that, how you got into farming, how many acres are we talking about right now? And like, how did that start? And are we no till at this point or you guys were still using tillage so, as you were trying to learn about your planters? We, um, so uh, I'm thinking back here, my father was always uh, innovative and trying to be uh, um, on the edge, so to speak. We started no tilling in 1982, but by the middle eighties, we decide we're gonna go 100%. We think tillage is like a drug or that you can't go. You, do you know anybody that uses um, a rotational drug use or alcohol use? You gotta go all or nothing. You can't go, well, I'm gonna use a little little meth this weekend and then I'll skip. Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it, hit the bottle go on this a nice weekend, bender. but I'm gonna back off next weekend and get some graces back and then I'll sin later um so we think it's you we're pure no-till if you could see our one little piece of tillage equipment it's a 24 foot absolutely junked out uh little field finisher that we use for uh tile lines and a occasional little gully but it it's it's so uh it's it you yeah it's nothing all that shiny and oh it barely rolls anymore so <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so but, we're pure, no so, chill. But pure, so since the 80s, and we're going to get into why all this was happening in the 80s, but is that then what really spurred about trying to dig into the equipment? Okay, okay. so if you can imagine us trying to grow our family uh, farm operation, I remember Dad told us one day, he said, boys, there isn't, and he was talking to Nick and I, he said, there's no acres here, I can't spare anything. If you want to farm, you're going to find your own acres, and he goes, I'll rent you my equipment because how big was the farm at that yeah, time? we were 760 acres at that time okay. and so uh um as we went out and rented and grew our farming operation we were we have a hog operation also and so we were severely limited on time and we could see the efficiencies that no-till would bring about but when you're 
farming across larger areas you're trying to push those critical weather w windows mm -hmm. we knew we had to find a way to take no-till way beyond where it had been at this point because we didn't want to wait to plant we wanted to plant two days before anybody else sure like every other farmer exactly zach exactly so uh we 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 had to find a way to push this thing beyond and i need to say that it wasn't only equipment but we ran into a agronomic fertilizer company that helped us understand the precepts and how important uh pop-up fertilizer and banding fertilizer with the planter that that those no-till early on in no-till those first several weeks are a big a time that no-till can be in at a disadvantage so with some of these uh uh, fertilizer tools and agronomic tools, it helped us understand how important those were and bring all those pieces together into a total uh, system, if you will. So people always want to grab, well, I'll put row cleaners on. My no-till didn't work. Cherry pickers. Well, cherry pickers. That's what we call them. I'll, I'll, you already see if they didn't address the down pressure. So we try and run. I need to go back. We would run with, we would run no down pressure, half a bag of seed or less in the in the seed box, and we would be planting, you know, a day or two ahead. But mm -hmm. we learned how important this down pressure and what an enemy it is. But nowadays with Delta Force and everything else, we like we have Delta Force on, and we'll run custom 20 pounds of margin is our goal. And we run, if you look at our average down pressure, it's negative 160 mm -hmm. pounds. Mm -hmm. We run with an average uplift, not down pressure. So when you're running in these high clay soils early on, weight is your arch enemy. And so remember I talked about this wedging and compressing. And so you have to negate that. That is a that is in these high clay soils. So an interesting thing for down here, for reference for everybody, is we do have a wide array of different types of soils. And and as Paul was just hitting on, there's a wide array of different soils, even within their own operation. There is in our operation too. We range from five CSR to 100 CSR on our farm, all over the place. And uh, because of that, it does take the technology to dial in and make sure that you're getting the seed started right from the beginning. And one of the key things I always talk about is the seed has the best potential for yield when it's in the bag. As soon as you take it out of the bag and put it in the soil, it can only lose yield potential. Right. So it's if everything you from there it up on. from day one, yep. you're never going to get that back. So learning how to dial that in is really crucial. And that's where Dave Mullet comes in. Tell us a little bit about um, what you have going on in, uh, in your operation. So... We actually started right out of high school at an ag repair business in Washington. And we were at that business for nine years. And then they closed the doors with the 80s tough times. And uh, we just had a five-month-old child. And we got forced into being an independent ag repair business. So it's been going well since then. So that's 31 years. Just completed that here in August. Is this where you started with that? It was right here? Actually, no. We lived in Washington, and when that business closed, we actually had a service vehicle that we went to the field, and that was our main business. We went, we actually serviced items in the field, whether it's combines, tractors, skid loaders, planters. So everything was mobile everything at that time? Everything was mobile at that time, and then we moved here to our facility in 1991, so okay. been here since. It's like a food truck for farm equipment, Zach. Yeah, it is. That's, that's awesome. a good way to think of it. We yeah. can show you that did, later. Did we, you have like the little like the ice cream truck like musical have deal that. going too? That would have been be, awesome. The diesel fuel smell. <laughs> the diesel fuel <laughs> smell. <laughs> and so and and just you know fresh harvested crops. That would be just awesome. That would be awesome. That smell would bring people to you. Just drive down the gravel roads slowly, and yeah. the farmers would start chasing you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the cows too. The cows too. Yeah. Well. Dave, I want to see what you, what your answer is on this. Two years ago, I added row cleaners to the planter, and we tried some no-till. In my defense, everybody tells me if you're going to break into no-till and you want to do it, the simplest first thing you always hear is start small. Try it on 10 acres, 20 acres, 40 acres, whatever, right? Okay, well, I can do that, but the, the fact of the matter is that I'm also trying to farm another 3,000 acres with two people full-time. We own one planter. So how do I go and say it's worth it to find another planter, completely redo my planter for 40 acres to start small? Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. 
I mean, what do you, what do you do? Well, and, and one of the biggest things is when you've, one of the first things you need to have on a planter is the row cleaner, obviously. I mean, even in, even in a minimum tillage situation, you need to move the trash out of the path of the row unit. So you're going to still take in, you know, when a customer calls or a person calls grower wise and, and, you know, asks about planter attachments, that's probably one of the first things you want to find out. Does he have row cleaners on the planter? Because First and foremost, we need to either move the trash out of the way if it's no till, or if it's in minimum till, we need to make sure that we're not hairpinning that trash into the slot. Because mm-hmm. anytime it gets back to the seed to soil contact, if you have something in there that's wicking the moisture away from the seed, it's not going to take and sprout or grow within the first 24, 36 hours. We want that warm drink to get it off and off to a good start. But um, so, like I say, on the row cleaner side, that is one of the probably the most important things to take and have on that planter. Obviously, everything else starts. Adding from there, attachment-wise, obviously you can't dive into everything, but technology has just come a long way. Just like Paul said, we, I mean, I remember back in the day on when we were at home in the farming operation helping there, we had an old 333 Alice Tremors no-till planter. And one of the things they talked about is flipping the frame over to get the, the actual no-till colder back closer to the row unit. Well, we had two-inch wide holders, wavies on that planter, and it would take and throw soil everywhere in no-till. That was back in 80, 81, I think we were playing with playing with that. Again, row cleaners weren't even a thing of, you know, being around. But we took a, a two-inch wavy colder off and put on a, we had an old case plow sitting in the corner. It hadn't been used for a while. We went and got the smooth colder off of that and put that in place with a two-inch wavy. And we didn't have the, the soil being erupted out of the out of the actual row unit area. So it, it was one of the things that st- started the process of different attachments so we, we've come a long way from ro- runner runner system on a planter to double disc openers to now we've got no-till colder out front um, that was supposed to be you know something to help the situation for getting that seed into the spot it needs but then the road cleaner come about and it moved the trash out of the way so we don't have to hairpin that trash in the ground yeah so it's moving that stuff out of the way you guys pulled the coulter off of a different piece of equipment Correct. and just threw it on there, threw right. it together. Because was, we didn't want that soil being thrown out of the... At that point, was there anybody else that was looking at, you know, the equipment side of this? Where would you go to be able to get help on your equipment? This is early 1980s. Where did you guys go to actually get some of this equipment? Or maybe for Paul, too. Well, we were probably one of our best. That's what I was going to inject to... Uh, uh, Zach, when he answered, is a mentors. You need to have a mentor, someone that can help help you. We all have a, a new word, uh, unintentional bias. And that simply means we're good at what we know and not at what we don't. So we follow Jim Cancello is one of the main ones. We made many trips to his farm. Where is, he, where is he from? Lexington, Kentucky. And he's alive oh. and farms with his son, Brian. He would be an excellent person. Lexington, to Lexington Illinois. Lexington, excuse me, it's, Lexington, <laughs> Illinois excellent person to talk to he's the first guy that helped us understand the damage that we we're doing and that's what i've started to say about this colder we started with cultures and if you understand uh uh coulter also that our goal our goal is to be able to plant two days sooner and not have any detrimental effects and be able to pull into any farmer's soil a coulter was it would bring up wet chunks a smooth coulter in some of our high clay will bring up chunks as big as your eight head Mm -hmm. and it will stick to your depth tires on your planter and you will have to go park your planter and wait a week or two to plant so that is not our goal so if you understand that our goal was to be able to plant in any type of soil uh, expand our planting windows uh, be able to plant sooner in virtually any conditions and get even uh, early even growth a coulter it, it, and it takes a lot of down pressure to hold it in the ground. It does about everything bad. And that's why we're pushed into the row cleaners and, and what a breakthrough they were. Well, we always talk about two things that cost you a lot of money is waiting for the ground to dry out and adding weight to the planter unit. Two things that will cost you a lot of money. As in, it can cost you in yield. So those were the things you need to take and think about when you're setting up your planter unit. Yeah, so just a lot more moving pieces now that you're adding more complexity to that planter as well, trying to figure out what, you know, what are those pros and cons and benefits and stuff of it. One of the things that we've talked about is there was some work going on in the county with 
the extension and things like that and field days and stuff going on. Tell us more about the early pieces of just now in Washington County and some of you guys that were really early and working together and working with local extension agents. So I have to give a lot of credit to the Burgers, um, the Steels, and there was a Lukoski's, and there were several other families that were even ahead of us uh, working with different aspects. But we tried to take it more mainstream and take it out on a lot wider scale instead of kind of a niche a niche thing or kind of a, a, a um, uh, you know, an in, in interesting thing, but it couldn't be used across thousands of acres. Uh, um, and so that's where, what our goal was, was to push it way beyond. Beyond and, the hippies. Yep. That's so, what you're saying. Uh, and the equipment was evolving at that time. And um, we compared notes and it helped us learn very quickly. And so in the space of several, about five years, by the early 90s, it was starting to come together. And by the light, late 90s, we had it. And I actually did some public speaking with a company of Dave of I've and I have flown around and done competitive problems and problem solving planting. So they we would fly to people that have struggled and had problems and help them diagnose their problems. And we've done competitive planning in Ohio where the different companies would have different setups. And I remember the one day they landed at Washington to pick up Dave and I, and we had all of our armload of attachments that we're going to put on two rows of the planter. And they said, oh, we're so disappointed. We had a half inch of rain last night. We're going to, we're not going to be able to plant. And we said, that's fine. You guys can stay in the tent. We're going to plant. <laughs> and we did. And that family converted uh, their whole farming operation over after, after seeing uh, how well it worked. And the next spring I asked him, I said, how'd you get along this spring with all the changes? Cause they're planting right up against Lake Erie. It's high clay, wet soils, can't no till. You're not supposed to be able to. They said, you know, we got that spin half a day. It was plenty wet. The plant, the tires were sinking and getting everything set by the afternoon. We could see it look good. And we started planting. They said, if we had to do it all over again, we'd start a day or two sooner. <laughs> I knew right then they had it. We also planted uh, in that, uh, Meeting in Ohio, it was on March March fifteenth, sixteenth, and we went out and test planted with a four row planter. And we had everybody different attachments on each row, and we had a couple rows set up on that planter. And I called the guys back about two weeks later, and they said the corn grew up in our two rows. So they were pretty impressed that we could go out and actually, like I say, make it work in a cold, wet soil condition. So but yeah, those lots of, like I say the and then when we went up in uh, Michigan is where that was, up near Climax, Michigan. And I know there we joked because they when the when the grower was talking about, yeah, you'll when you go to our fields, there's going to be lots of rocks. And I said, well, we did see a sign on the way up that said, beware of rocks. And he was right. There was rocks everywhere. We'll get back to our interview with Paul Reed and Dave Moeller in a sec. But right now it's time for a quick break. So, Dave, I've got a, a John Deere 1770 planter um, we do on our farm with the V openers, a standard style planter. We are all conventional till. We've got the row cleaners on it now, and we've got, uh, we don't have uh, the pneumatic. We do have pneumatic downforce. Um, we don't have the hydraulic stuff. Right. Being the, the specialist you are when it comes to equipment, what, what can you suggest for me to help me out as far as improving that planter if we were to try some, some more no-till acres with it? So even on the tillage side with attachments, I mean, there's there's different things. Obviously, there's a lot of technology out there. Um, when you get into tillage, you know, it depends on if you're going to, when I compare like a hydraulic downforce system to a pneumatic system that's automated on both sides, if you're in full tillage, the advantage for that automation, probably ain't going to show up near as much as it would be when you start to venture into the no-till side. Right. Um, so like I say, again, the technology side has come a long way in the last 30 years. I mean, we're we're talking, you know, we started out with no-till colders and we've pulled them off and went to row cleaners. Now we got air-adjusted row cleaners, so we can adjust them on the go from different soil types, different tillage types, uh, the amount of trash you actually have in the system. So... Uh, 
again, it's it's a matter of you got to take and find out what the grower, how his operation's working, what's going to best fit, benefit him. Um, I mean, there's some technology that's coming for the closing side of it now, uh, automation wise with airbag. So you might get better benefits from that versus actually going, you know, away from a airbag system that's in full tillage. You might have another option to help you expand your, I mean, it all goes back to, to actual ear count. And if you can increase your ear count, obviously you're going to get more yield. So we're trying to get ear count or rows around and length to get that advantage. And you got to make a decision of, you know, where, where are you finding issues in your operation? What do you need to improve on? I mean, we talked about with the seed to soil contact. Now it gets into, you know, do I have an issue with actual compaction that I'm, you know, am I creating a compaction issue with the attachment I have on the planter? We need to address that and actually look at the whole operation. So what you're saying is my best option would be to fly you and Paul up in the spring with a box full of attachments. That'd be good, but that'd be expensive. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is our that is our go-to time. Everybody wants to know when we have time off, and I say it's usually from December 26th to January 1st. That's my slow time. Hmm. I hate that week. It's such an <laughs> awkward week. Like the world's not really moving the way it should be. It's just a weird week. But so, Zach, with your planter, though, you have seen like, so you put on the um, trash rippers, but they didn't really work. You got to call them row cleaners. Row cleaners. Sorry, you can't call them trash rippers. Row cleaners, you put those on, but they didn't really work exactly how you wanted. Now, maybe part of that is the down pressure. And what we're getting at on the pneumatic versus the Delta Force or some of these hydraulics is the amount of change and flexibility to them. Because I think we have Delta Force on our planter, too, for our row cleaners. So we and have I think the, they the, change like 200 times a second. Yes. On the, on the, that's on the row unit pressure. That No. So the row unit pressure, we have pneumatic on that. But the, the trash ripper itself, we have a separate... Delta Four system just on the row cleaner. I was not aware of that. So we've got the we've got the adjustable downforce on our row cleaners, but you know you set the number and it is where it is. Right. But I think a, a big number one. I had never used the system before. So when there's one tiny pinhole air leak somewhere, nothing works right. Right. And that was the first thing I chased for quite a while, till eventually I got sick of it and I just raised them all up and planted without the dang things because they were causing more problems than they were worth. Um, eventually when you slow down a little bit, we got to soybeans, we were working with a little more residue on our conventional till and you start messing with them and you, you get better at running them and understanding the nuances of how they should work right. and, and where they should be set. And so that helped a lot. The other thing is, you know, we are, we're all conventional till and dad hasn't, hadn't run roll cleaners in 30 years because he said when they first came out, they were way more problems than what they were right. worth. Well, we weren't used to running them, and I just don't know. In our situation, at least half the time, they're not necessary. They're just not needed. Our right. ground is so soft and, and fluffy. And and you're probably just moving either light surface trash or even maybe some clods that are in the way. You want right. to have a smooth ride for the planter unit. But, yep. uh, like I say, that's when, when the row cleaners come out, they're pin adjust. So you were constantly out there trying to get them fine-tuned. You're either moving... Usually you're moving a little too much, but a little too much is probably better than not enough because you're getting rid of the hairpin issues. Yeah. Yeah. Once I got mine set to where I liked them and they were running well, I adjusted very little. Yeah. Maybe from field to field or Correct. certain conditions, it, you know, different crops are planting into different residue, thicker residue or whatever, but it's not like I'm chasing my tail the whole time no. by any means. No. So, but yeah, I, I, like I say, that was one of the things that uh, has, you know, to me, row cleaners are a a big advantage on a row on a row unit. That's one of the first things we put on, even if you're tillage. So, Dave, you can send your bill to Zach um, here after this on helping on the uh, free advice there on his planter. <laughs> so, but walk us back with uh, how your company has now evolved. Okay, so now we're getting to early '80s. There's some interest in Washington County. There's some people trying it out. They're going all over the place to get help and get some advice on equipment. How were you able to kind of get in on that, and how has your business evolved? So, like I mentioned, we, we worked at a, a local ag equipment uh, business, an Alice Chalmers dealership, and they were also a Kinsey dealer. So we were in planter setup and, and maintenance, and, uh, again, talking with uh, local growers and stuff, that you know, what their concerns were, uh, no-till starting to evolve. We went with what we're, you're classifying as a trash ripper. It was a disc-type 
cleaner. So it moved a lot of soil and it moved trash also, but it just, that was the start of it. And trying to get, you know, attachments on the planter to do a better job of getting that seed in the ground. So uh, after after that business closed and we got our own, then like Paul mentioned, we uh, got to talk to Howard Martin back in 1991 is when we got set up with him. And uh, actually, actually, when we moved here to our to our facility here in the country, um, row cleaners were really just starting to take off. And, you know, again, being a fortune to be around, once we got row cleaners on and saw what they could do in a no-till situation, it's like it, it kind of just was a booming thing. And we were selling row cleaners all across the United States. And, I mean, here we are, just a little small potato outfit, but yet, we were, you know, seeing guys calling, you know, and it's one of those things. Again, you, we wrote a lot of planters. We actually, when we had, you probably never knew that there was these big VCR cassette recorders. I mean, they were actual video recorders, big things you carried on your shoulders. We had one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I actually wrote a planter. We had it in a bag. We covered it with a bag except for the actual camera. And we were writing, writing planters, watching row units work and having it for our propaganda when we go to these farm shows and stuff. So... Uh, when you take and ride a planter carrying around a big old 10 pound VCR camera. And then, and then the nice thing was we'd take and go back and watch it in slow motion. And that's where we actually come up with another one of our, uh, products that we actually sell is it's, it's a, a fertilizer knife for John Deere openers. So we were actually riding Paul's planter and he was complaining about, you know, having some issues with some dragging and things. And it's like, when you watch that thing in slow motion, it's like, all right, things start to come together. We could actually make something better. But I think it all goes back to being in association with not only just here, just, I mean, you, you source your people that you want to take, you know, you get somebody that's out of, out of your area and, and actually they're trying something different. It's like, well, maybe we could try that around here. And then you incorporate that into the, the system and, and everything starts to be a puzzle and you're starting to put the pieces together. So but yeah so being just super observant though too that's yeah. what kind of what we've talked about before yeah on being observant i hadn't thought about it as far as being slowing down so much that you're literally watching in slow motion yeah that's a different way to kind of think about it i think but um but being able to take some of that and grow with it and and now how has your business evolved since the planter time zach and i have been talking about the gleaners that we've got around here so you're not just working on planters nowadays. No, and that's like I say, I, I would say we're probably right now sixty percent planter repair and attachments. Um, and then we got forty percent that's divided up in with combine repair, which we are we are known for gleaner combines in this area. Um, we started out with that again back at the Alice Chalmers dealership and and uh, having a lot of a lot of things that got taken and played with. Um, we actually I mean, that goes back to, again, going and, and looking at combines in the field and watching what they do. And then just like you were talking earlier, you know, having issues with, you know, cop breakage and stuff. And you got to go back and find out what's causing that and start from the root problem and, you know, try to work it back from there. But um, so, yeah, we've got about 40 percent that's in the in the cleaner combines and we do some tractor repair, older tractor repair. I mean, we're. You know, it's one of those things with technology and, and things we've decided not to get into the the uh, computer side of it. We're going to leave that to the dealership side of it. I mean, we've got enough that we can stay busy with what we work with. You'd rather turn wrenches than spend the money on the $100,000 computer programs they need to plug into e the tractors? Exactly, yeah. yes. And yeah. like I say, it's one of those things, too, you know, you could take – we have, we have two employees, so uh, we're not – big time by no means but yet like i say we're comfortable with what we do and uh i'm i'm happy with the size of the operation we have it's not something that's overbearing and and uh you know you got to be able to take and you know walk away from it at night and and go at it the next day but I, I look forward to taking and turning wrenches and you know get my hands dirty you get out in the country and and you're not confined to an office every day so right right this is a really interesting conversation to me because up where I'm at, and it, it's, it is all conventional till. And when you ask around and you, and you talk to the farmers that have been around for a while, I mean, the reason is because they tried no-till in the 80s or the early 90s, and they got burned by it so badly that they're just, they're, they're not even open to the idea because it, it hurt them that badly. And, and when we talk about, you know, moving 
something that works here in Washington County or somewhere else up to where I'm at, and and you look at how do you get it to work up there, everybody says, you know, start small, give it time, um, try cover crops. Well, how much time do you have if it isn't working correctly? Right. Um, we've tried cover crops four times and had zero success with them to this point. Uh, probably something that we're doing, I don't know, but I haven't seen anybody in my area have success with that or no-till. If I want to start small, what do I need for machinery? But the conversation here, especially going back to the planter again, I hate to hound on that too much, but to me that is interesting because if we're starting off on the wrong foot right away and not giving that seed a chance, it, it doesn't matter what the combine's going to do. That the, right. the plant has to be there. The plant has to be healthy. And so if it's something we're doing in the machinery and and... If you want to, if you want to blame it on the true V openers or whatever they had in the '80s and early '90s, maybe that was a problem that everybody overlooked, and and for some reason it's just never been brought up to me that way. Yeah, never come back around. So maybe Paul, back to you on on Zach's question earlier on how what do you look at first on adjusting the planter, and on and then maybe tie that in on the fertility placement a little bit too. We kind of brushed by that earlier. How does that piece tie in? It it's. What we learned in those models in March was that not only the way the true V opener was set up, but also the weight was our enemy. And so back to Zach's question, um, uh, other than a row cleaner, I would say to, to manage anything, you have to be able to measure it. And so back to the weight, how do you know that you have the right down pressure for your system? I talked about us running a lot of up pressure. Um, and so unless you can measure it, uh, you don't know where you're at. And every type of tillage system and soil type demands different amounts of down pressure. And, and, and so every it, spring. Every spring. Every exactly. time you plant, every, every field is different. Every field or part of the field right. or end of the planter is different. So that's what the technology now, back when we were only running half a bag of seed, we were trying to manage our and reduce our down pressure. But now with Delta Force, you can, and John Deere has a name, an ag leader, you can manage your down pressure from the cab and get it right for your situation. So that's, that's where I would start to look. But back to the, in your own operation is some way to manage your downforce because we unknowingly are causing a lot of that. Remember I talked about the 800 pounds, right. the, small, the weight of a steer on the row unit and the high clay soils. And so that weight, that compaction and compression is, a, is, a, is your enemy no matter what type of tillage or soil jams. So how do you actually measure that though? Like in adjust on the fly, you have to go like you're going and digging and looking at the actual sidewall and like the smearing and that's how deep what, it is and all that or what? That's what we look at. But Dave, he Dave knows and precision has recommendations. Obviously you heard me talk about that we go outside the custom. We go custom settings, but you could start out we run the light setting and in the conditions we plan in, it's way too heavy. It's way too much. It looks nasty. We start to get sidewall compaction. We have to run custom when we're running these high clay. Wet soil is a lot lighter. But with Zach doing some tillage, he probably needs a little more down pressure to start to kind of form that firm true it up v, a little bit. Firm it up a little bit. So that's why I say they're all different. I have a little story to, <clears throat> to tell real quick. Uh, Jerry Hatfield's ahead of the National Soil Tilt Lab here at in Ames, he just retired uh, after 30 some years, but he set up a system several years back. He got a grant, a million dollar grant, and he had six cooperators over the state, all different tillage types, and he had them use all similar tools and then compare their yields and for five years. And we did that and we were part of it down here. But what he found, I'll boil it down to, is whatever the cooperator did on their home farm that's what won in their comparison. And that's where that unintentional bias. In other words, a false strip tiller, false strip till one in his farm. The no tiller in Southwest Iowa, no till one in his farm. Uh, the deep ripper from Northern Iowa, uh, deep ripping one in his farm. And so one of my guy down here in Southeast Iowa, no till one in his farm, but he was transitioning to no till and was totally open. And what we found down here is he found was root lodging. He went, he did it six years, three out of the six years. He had a lot of root lodging where they did this heavy tillage. But um, he visited one of these cooperators, the false strip till guy, and here the, the no-till looked terrible. And he said, what is going on? This doesn't look anything like ours. And he said, well, 
we didn't, the fertilizer attachments weren't working right. So we had the co-op come in later on and blow on the fertilizer on top. And uh, it just isn't the same. Everything in our system, we have tried everything. It's a systems approach. You know, if you, so we banned, we put on pop-up fertilizer on the seed with a, uh, biostimulant, micronutrients, and an insecticide. We've tried to pull the insecticide out. You'll occasionally have um, uh, an ins uh, insect problem. Yeah. Um, and then we banned nitrogen and sulfur and boron uh, with the uh, Y-bander on the back of the planter so that it, it each seed has equal access no matter what the moisture, no matter the soil type, no matter the residue level, each seed sees the same amount of fertility. And so we get even early growth. It's kind of back to the pork thing. We used to feed sows out in the field and we'd go out and throw out uh, sow cubes or grain to 50 hungry sows, hoping they'd all get the same amount. Ha <laughs> ha. And now we have G barns where we each feed each sow individually the sow the fat sows you can limit their dump box a little bit or the skinny ones give them a little more so i like to think that's what we're doing with our planter in the field yeah. letting each seed see the same amount of fertility so again i think it, it boils back to like that precision piece of it of course and like really fine-tuning and and understanding but it's tough to be that patient too and like you guys were able to learn from each other but the the million dollar question is how do we how do you scale that? And Zach and I are millennials. We are not patient. So again, it's we've got to see results like quick, and we have a lot more access to data. I think to look at things differently. But what are some of the crucial pieces that are the takeaways from Washington County that need to be scaled to make sure that other farmers can have success, especially the laggers that you mentioned before, the the later adopters that. Are, it's going to be tough, and there's a lot of people that are coming into this with a "nope, I don't, I don't want it to work" kind of a deal, just like in Jerry Hatfield's study. So, how do we take what we've learned here? What are going to be the components to actually scale? I think the three, three, there'd be three important items in uh, education, uh, mentoring, and networking. Those are the three items, and I think if if you don't have any one of those idea, uh, any one of those blo building blocks you're gonna be doomed to failure. So if you don't have a mentor, you don't have networking, and if you don't have education to know, why am I doing this? How does it impact what I'm doing? And uh, uh, you know, why, do, why does pop-up fertilizer, why do I need, what, how does banding nitrogen, why am I doing that? And how does that, what piece does that play? If you don't understand that, then you're gonna fall away and cherry pick and you're gonna be doomed to failure. So, Zach, that's a little bit different wording to, I think, the conversations we've had before. We typically say it's, you know, you have to have the, this dealer and this dealer and this NRCS person and this extension person. But what Paul just said was, no, you don't necessarily have to have those individual pieces. It's having somebody else that's also there that you can learn with, having some educational components that you can go the field days or the extension event. Maybe that's part of it, but it's just a little bit different wording to it, I think, than what we've heard before. Yeah, we talk a lot about how logistically and financially you've got to be able to make changes to your operation. And just to back up a little bit on what Paul said, too, the systems approach thing. And you talked about how what everybody, when, when you ran that test, what the farmers were running for their main operation is what won their yield test. And to me, that's got to come back to that's what they do best. Mm -hmm. That's what they have the equipment for. That's what they're passionate about. That's what they've always done. That's what they're educated on. And so, of course, that's going to win the test, right? So you look at the systems approach. You go to that. Well, their system was set up for the system they had in place. And that's what I always talk about logistically. Dad and I are two people running 3,000 acres. Our system is set up to be super efficient at what it is. If you take a wrench and you chuck it into the gears, all of a sudden we're, we're spending a lot of time to test 40 acres of no-till on a 3,000-acre situation. So you talk about, you know, the, the financial side of it that can hurt you or could help you and the logistics side of it. But now you're saying the education and the networking side of it 
and you know, I think probably the Fieldwork podcast can help with that. I suppose so. Maybe <laughs> that's like kind of the point, huh? <laughs> no, that's awesome. So, but no, that that's true on like how how it does dial in, and that yeah, everyone's set up for your system. And a little thing that my mind went to there is that's why I'm super against one size fits all regulation too. Uh, yeah, well, because if you throw that out there, there's gonna be so many people that lose their family farms. Yeah. It's, because they, they they don't understand it. It does have to be a process, but but it's how do we scale that, you know? So like forty acres, yeah, that's a pain to to attempt to manage that. Right. And just like I mean, just like in you guys' companies yeah, you're going to help the little farmer that's, you know, it's a couple hundred dollar job or a couple thousand dollar job when you could go and have the big operator, but you kind of want to help that guy out too. So I don't know. How do you, how do you think about that in other companies or like how, how does somebody. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're farming 200 acres or 20,000 acres, you still need that help networking and reaching out and finding out what's, you know, what's going to be best for your operation. Obviously you'd, like I say, there's a lot of money involved when in some of these planter attachments, and it can add up quick. I mean, I can, blow, I can go out and buy a used planter for $140,000, and I can put another 100000 on top of that with attachments. So, you know, you want to make sure you take and think about what you're spending your money on. Return on investment is big time. That's farmer Paul Reed and his cousin Dave Muller, an equipment dealer from Washington County, Iowa. In our next episode, we'll hear from farmers who benefited from Paul and Dave's innovations. And just a reminder here that I actually made a video about our trip to Washington County for my Millennial Farmer YouTube channel. So if you want, you can learn a little bit more about the folks that we're interviewing. We've got it reposted on our Fieldwork YouTube channel, which is at Fieldwork Talk. I also wrote a blog post about the project that we link to in the show notes for this episode. That's it for Fieldwork today. Our show is produced by Annie Baxter with lots of help this season from Lori Stern, Amy Mayer, Mike Langseth, and Corey Suzuki. Kristen Schmidt runs our social media, LA Lyons does our marketing, and Lauren Humper is our project coordinator. Special thanks to Veronica Rodriguez, Eric Romani, and Johnny Vince Evans for engineering and mixing our shows this season. Johnny Vince also composed and performed our theme music. We're once again at Fieldwork Talk on all of the social media channels. We'd really love to hear from you on this topic of conservation culture. Is there that culture where you live? What does it look like? Or if there isn't one, uh, why do you think you don't have the conservation culture in your area? Yeah, don't hit us up on TikTok, but you can drop us a message at 651-228-4810. We would love to hear from you. Again, that is 651-228-4810. Thanks everybody for listening.